you for tuning in to Season 4 of Talking Bay 94, the Star Wars podcast devoted to interviews with the cast, crew, and creators of a galaxy far, far away. I'm your host, Brandon Winerdy, and today I'm talking to Ty Ruben Ellingson, visual effects art director who has worked on a ton of projects, including the Star Wars A New Hope Special Edition. Whether breaking his arm on Jurassic Park or drawing floating Jabba's, we dive into his story and what George Lucas really said in that first special edition meeting. This is Talking Bay 94, episode 54, Kai Ruben Ellis. How did you first get started? Like, so when you were growing up, what were your first inspirations? You started more fine arts and more painting wise, right? And then how did you kind of find your way into film and, and visual effects? Well, I I think for me, it all started with 2001 Space Odyssey because I saw that at like the age of eight or nine and I saw it in 70 millimeter and I'd I'd never, I mean, I'd never seen it and no one had, but it made such a profound impact on me, both visually, um, but also it was the first time when my father who took me to the movie couldn't adequately explain it to me. Like (laughs) I was asking him like, what were those ape men? You yeah. know, and he's like, well, what do you think they are? And I go, well, I don't know. And then he would say, well, when you figure it out, like come back to me. And I, I found that really fascinating that my father didn't seem to know any more about it than me. And and so it was from that experience. And, I, and when the Discovery spacecraft comes by, you know, with the giant details and engines and stuff, which I know was in, uh, uh, something that inspired George with, uh, <clears throat> you know, with the opening of the Star Wars films. I remember finding out that that those were made with models and that somebody must have designed those. And so at that point, I thought, wow, I wonder who gets to design that stuff. And I started drawing lots of spaceships and lots of, you know, fantastic machinery and future stuff. But as I got a little older, um, I was growing up in St. Cloud, Minnesota at that time, which is north of Minneapolis. And even though I had visited the West Coast as a, you know, on a family trip, I didn't know anything about it. And it seemed incredibly far away. There wasn't really much sense that you could do things like movie making or, you know, it was like another universe. So I focused on the things that I could do. And that was painting and drawing. And and my father was a fine artist and as it was teaching fine arts. And so I just did what lots of kids do. I followed in his footsteps. And over that period of time, I really became interested in photorealism painting in a manner that looks like a photograph Mm -hmm. and that requires a lot of technical skill and it requires a lot of studying reality and studying photography and knowing how things are affected by cameras and all that kind of focus on detail and technical skill unbeknownst to me really prepared me um you know as a as an illustrator and designer even though i was working in the fine arts sphere um at the same time i was extremely interested in movies and i just didn't miss a movie. I saw every movie that was screened. And when I got to university, I saw every screening of every movie in the student commons. And I watched late night TV and I read the, I would read the TV guide. Well, we just got the Sunday paper, but I would read it like, and plan my week around television. I never missed Roger and Gene, Siskel and Ebert. Um, Back then those prints, when they sent prints out to go to theaters, they would send out less prints. It would take them longer to go around. So oftentimes in St. Cloud, we would get the, the big movies would come out after the Oscars. I mean, they wouldn't even be in the theaters yet. So long story short, um, when I went to graduate school in Dallas, um, I just had some kind of personal epiphany, uh, for lack of a better word, where I thought before I commit to a life as a, an art educator, which is what I was studying to be, I really, I really owe it to myself to see how far I could get towards working in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And once I made that mental shift, uh, I just didn't take no for an answer. And I literally, people always, my students ask me this question all the time, but I literally networked yeah. from Dallas, Texas to you know San Rafael, California, where ILM was, right. and I leveraged an interview. And I just took my credit card and I flew out yeah. And I met with Jeff Mann, um, and I met Bill George, and I had the, they had seen my portfolio. And it actually, weirdly enough, after I was hired, and I'd been there for a while, um, I was told that they were impressed with my portfolio because I had included some of my fine artwork, and that it was so different than the typical portfolio that contained, you know, 
uh, X-wing fighters and, right. and spacecraft and aliens and all the stuff you'd expect. Right. And I had some of that in there, but I also had these really, you know, diverse, you know, fine art pieces that were everything from abstraction to like, I remember one of the pieces I showed was this, this kind of demonic looking character with a big beak, like a bird. And, and, and then like some really, some work that was really almost 100% abstract. And they, they told me that they were impressed by the range, but also when you, when you do a lot of portfolio reviews, you're looking for something unexpected. And it really was like, wow, this is some really interesting stuff. Yeah. You know, he might have a good, interesting perspective to share if we get him in here and put him on some projects. So, so then I just moved there. As soon as they get, I, they, they weren't really going to offer me the job. And then I said, um, well, what if I'm here? Like they said, well, you live in Dallas. And I said, I I know, but when I was here, and if you were here, we, you know, we'd try you out. And so then I just said, well, I'll, I'll be, and I just moved, <laughs> and I got an apartment. <laughs> I love it. And then I started. Well, uh, as someone in Dallas trying to end up working uh, at Lucasfilm, that is uh, one of the more inspiring stories uh, that I've heard. So some of your initial projects at ILM, uh, you know, Casper's, Flintstones, Jurassic Park, what were you doing Initially, I saw a clipping from Cinefix where you were doing some of like the um, background mat work for even like Flintstones and applying some of that fine art uh, skills you had. What were kind of your early yeah. projects at ILM? Um, well, the very first the very first project that kind of put me on the map there was what they call a um, a, a motion ride film which is like star tours, mm -hmm. you know, you sit in a motion based simulator and then you're watching a movie and then the movie is like showing you as though you're flying and then the seats move. And it, it just so happened that there was a company called ShowScan, and that was actually originally founded by Doug Trumbull one and went on to do the effect or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, and he invented this process of projecting film at 60 frames a second. So ShowScan really means uh, high-speed projection and when you project film at that speed there's no longer um, any flicker that's perceivable to the eye and there's no uh, motion blur though there is it's just way way decrease right. so you get this super sharp image they were making these travelogue kinds of movies like rub going on a rubber raft down the river or going snow skiing and riding in a you know toboggan or whatever and they would take those cameras and they would actually strap them onto the gondola of a, you know, of a, a ski lift or whatever. Right. And then they would go back and then they had these seats that moved hydraulically and they yeah. would program those seats to match the movement of what you saw on the screen. And they were interested in expanding the offerings. And so they approached ILM with this idea of co-producing something. Mm -hmm. And the idea that came up was called Space Rays. The idea was of a, of a intergalactic um, you know, stock car race uh -huh. where it's all kind of out in the boondocks and the cars are all kludged together and, and then people get together illegally, you know, like, and, and <laughs> race these hot rod spacecraft. Yeah. And so that was, I was, I'd just been at the company for, I don't know, maybe a little over a year and I'd been working on television commercials on and off because Lucasfilm was also getting more involved, well, at least ILM was getting more involved in television commercials. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, it was, I was asked to, if I wanted to participate in that project, and it was actually, you mentioned Dennis Muir, and it was Dennis Muir, and it was kind of spearheading the charge. Scott Squires right. um, was directing it. Ned Gorman was producing it. Um, I was the the lead designer and eventually got the title of production designer. And that was a long project, and it put me in contact with, all the the people I had like studied and and kind of really looked up to looking at Starlog magazine and, right. and trying to figure out how visual effects worked. I mean Steve Golly, Bill George, all these you know kind of giants. And yeah. it, it ended up being made and you can actually find it on YouTube. Um, and it was the last all motion control and miniature photomechanical uh, optically printed um, uh, show of any scale that was done wow. before the onset of the digital transition. It was the largest models ever constructed at ILM um, because we were building this track that was, you had to run the camera over for long, long distances. Right. Um, and it just 
was really inventive and and there was a lot of freedom and I just was in the right place at the right time to really be um you know be able to just expand people listen to me I just it, it was one of those shows where it wasn't so um buttoned down and and kind of being like forced into a certain shape like what happens on features um that you could throw out ideas and it would get written into the script and so it would change and it was really free form and I think because of all that, it made an impression on, you know, uh, people at ILM that had been there for a while. Yeah. And then uh, I built a good relationship with Dennis. And then the next thing I did was Jurassic. And then Dennis asked me to, early on, like even before the deals were being made, I became part of that core team in the very beginning. Wow. And wow. after that, you know, there was Doug Chang and I, I really had um, experiences in that digital, new digital realm. Right. Um, and so if you had worked on a show the size of Jurassic, you know, you were so, you had so much more experience than anyone else because other, other people hadn't even worked in the digital shows yet. Right. So it kind of got me ahead. Like, like Doug had, had a similar experience with Forrest Gump and I think T2 as well. Yeah. Um, and it just, it, it was a, it was like expertise in an area that was still being written. Uh -huh. So it wasn't like you could, if you didn't know, it wasn't like you could go look it up. You had to kind of have it experiential learning, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then once that happened, I just, you know, went on to show to show through various, that's how ILM worked back in those days. It was sort of a bullpen of people then got pulled in. Uh, and then eventually, you know, it was because of my relationship with Jurassic Park and Dennis that I ended up, well, Space Race, Jurassic Park, <laughs> Casper, and then uh, leading to, to the... Moving to Jurassic Park really quickly, I would love to just kind of detail your involvement there and anything uh, that you might have picked up that then you took to to things like Star Wars and then as we'll discuss things with GDT and with Cameron and, and, and Blomkamp. What was the first Jurassic Park kind of thing that you were working on either with Murin or in that department? Well, I, one of the things that's most inspiring, and, and you'll, if, if you can, you know, sit down with Dennis Mirren, is that Dennis came from, uh, you know, really came from traditional movie making. So his knowledge of, of narrative storytelling in a cinematic format, uh, you know, is based on real world experience. And in so having had that, like, view of the world, um, and then bringing it into the digital realm, he 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 was very focused on grounding things in a reality that that he understood because it was the way that movies had been made and the way that movies looked. So he's very keen on thinking about okay, this is going to be artificial, but how do I make it very realistic? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about Jurassic was Steven Spielberg really didn't want it to be. Uh, about dinosaurs in the sense that you go, oh, look, wow, dinosaurs. He wanted to be like, you go to a place where dinosaurs are real. <laughs> like he, he always referenced travel films in the mm -hmm. beginning. And he referenced like um, Hitari, where it's basically a, an expedition in Africa. And the animals are there because they're real. And right. you run into and there's a real rhino and a real giraffe and a real elephant. And he wanted that vibe. You know, he wanted to be like, Sure, they're dinosaurs, but they're animals and they're real and you just bump into them. And so I think early on, what we did was there was a small group of us. I, I don't know the exact number, but my memory would be around 16 people. Right. Most of them were the CGI, you know, characters, the people that were, um, you know, the, the, the group that was working most aggressively, Mark DePay and Steve Williams and um, Stephen Fangmeyer and uh, people that were in that kind of a initial cohort of people that were, you know, moving the ball forward. And then we what we did was we got together with Dennis and we screened just lots of film. Lots of movies, you know, we watched King Kong, you know, we watched, you know, animations from Harryhausen and we watched, um, you know, um, uh, lots of natural footage, iguanas and right. alligators and and giraffes. And they even drug out the old Star Wars footage of elephants where they had painted white lines on the elephant's legs to kind of do studies for the walkers for Empire. And my role was really just to just be in the mix as somebody who had um, a visual you know, an art director is really somebody that is supposed to look at the process from an aesthetic standpoint, mm -hmm. not so much a technical standpoint, but like 
aesthetically, how are these um, various shots coming together? And you're kind of free as an art director to comment on both technical problems like, oh, I see a flicker, you know, like, oh, there's a flicker. And I don't know what that flicker is. Or to saying, hey, wouldn't it be more beautiful if the light was shifted partially towards the blue, you know, like we get some blue light in there. And so I wasn't operating as a technician at all, but I was part of the think tank. Um, and then I think I, what I was aware of was I wanted to, I really wanted to be on that show. I really wanted to make, make a difference. And so I think I went as far out of my way as I could to always have a good opinion. You know, like I did a lot of research on my own and I would come in with, you know, Hey, I found this out and, and, and everybody was doing that. But I think that I was aware that the opportunity was, um, really exceptional and I, I kind of, in my mind, I was like trying to forge a, a more of a place for my participation. Yeah, you know, saying yes to everything, and um, you know, trying to. I, I, I mean, everybody was there in that space, but I mean, it, it seemed like for me, I felt extra fortunate right. because so much of what was important was the technical side of the equation. So to be there more as like a, a creative aesthetic person. Uh, and then of course there was storyboarding. We used to do uh, what we call, you know, we, they would be storyboards that were done from the imagination of the director working with storyboard artists. But once they started shooting plate photography, that's the, the photography that was done on, um, you know, eight perf, uh, large format film, that actual footage, and we would trace it and then redraw the storyboards exactly to like, here's the shot and where's the dinosaur going to be. Mm-hmm. And so I did a lot of that kind of, um, I would call it um, facility type of work. Mm-hmm. And then in a few cases, I, you know, I got to do some, you know, some pattern, dinosaur patterns. And I learned how to, you know, run the early software to do some of the painting. So some of the stuff that I actually uh, was able to do digitally is actually on the dinosaurs in the movie. Wow. You know? That's crazy. This is the very forefront of, of what digital filmmaking is now. That's crazy. And it, it was, it was so hard. Like sometime, like the one thing that is, it was so hard. Everything was so hard. I know the story's repeated over and over, but in the beginning, the digital dinosaurs were only going to be way in the distance. They were going to be really tiny, you know, and they just kept moving them up. And the breakthroughs came and the technology yeah. evolved and the people were there so bright. There's such a brilliant group of people. Um, it was it was kind of mind, mind-blowing. Yeah. Like how much talent was in that screening room. I think at the end of the day, there was only like 46 or 47 people that wow. worked on the digital shots. Yeah. And um, I guess the one thing I should, everybody asked me, but if you watch the Gallimimus stampede, there's a scene where all the Gallimimus jump over this log and um, the, you know, um, Laura Dern and the doctor and everybody's hiding and they run over. And if you watch carefully, one of the, Gallimimus comes over the log and and trips, catches his foot on the log and falls, uh-huh. and it gets up and runs out. But that that's in the film because we were shooting tests of uh, all of the crew, myself and all the animators, pretending to be Gallimimus, and we were shooting actual reference photograph to see if we could discover how a big group of animals that were bipedal might jockey for space or how they might cut in front of each other and we had to created this big plastic pipe it was a one of those pipes they put under the street to represent the log the fallen log and when i went over that i caught my foot and then i i fell and i actually uh shattered my elbow and i had to go straight from there to the emergency wow. room and I never saw that footage for a, a long, long time. Uh, I didn't see it till after the movie was out. But when Phil Tippett saw it and saw me fall, he said, well, you know, if Ty fell, then one of the dinosaurs should fall. Yeah. And so they always referred to that falling dinosaur as Ty. Yeah. And so I was always, you know, very happy that it happened to me. And I broke my arm on Jurassic Park because of its notoriety. And, wow. You know, I, you know, I did it. break it on some other movie. <laughs> that is that is crazy. That is so yeah. crazy. Moving to Star Wars, A New Hope, Special Edition, what was it like uh, jumping from Jurassic, jumping from, you know, Casper and Flintstones, and then making the move to Star Wars, which I'm sure had its limitations because, A, there wasn't a ton of scenes that were added to it. Um, It wasn't like starting a whole movie from scratch. Uh, But what was the design process like trying to introduce new creatures and new ships and new um, everything into that world and, and what were, were the initial expectations at least of, of the special editions. You know, it's funny when you have these 
you know, that whole universe of Star Wars is so huge and complex and it's, it has so many layers and personalities and stuff. And, um, for me, the, um, I guess one of the things I, I would like to share that I don't know how much the story has actually got out before that may be of interest to your listeners because it's a little bit different is when, when the call first came up or down, depending on how you look at it from George's office to ILM, um, George was curious about the state of digital effects. And I think his curiosity was really sparked because of Jurassic Park, because I think that the, um, dinosaurs especially the brontosaurus made a big impact on him um and i think that he was starting to think you know i could i could go back and make some adjustments um so the initial so the initial call came down from george directly to dennis Muir, and, and then as i understand it george said i'm thinking about doing some modifications and additions to the original star wars um you know, I'd like to have a discussion about it, basically, is what how it came to me. Like I mentioned, I'd worked with Dennis on Jurassic, and I think we always had a really good rapport. And so he approached me and said, don't tell anybody, <laughs> but I'd like you to attend a meeting with George to talk about the possibility of going back to the original Star Wars and doing some a special edition. Now, I was always very careful because I was new to Hollywood and I was new to the the movie making universe right. that I was always very guarded about my being a fan right. because I wanted to be taken seriously as a professional and I actually worked that way the whole time and, and to this day like I would mean I actually would meet an actor or a director and inside like I'm screaming like, my God, I can't believe this is really happening. But on the outside, I'm all like, Hey, nice to meet you. Like I, oh, I yeah. really, you know, enjoyed your films because you know, you have to operate in that way. Now, fortunately for me, um, uh, I had interactions with George uh, fairly regularly in the first year that I was at Lucasfilm, which is another whole story. But I knew I knew he knew who I was, right. and I I wasn't as like overwhelmed by his presence as you know as I was in the first first meeting I ever had with him. Um, and I, I of course was a a huge Star Wars fan. Um, but what's interesting is Close Encounters came out that same year and in 1977, and I was a huge Star Wars fan too. So I was really like, I was a big movie fan, but Star Wars had a special location. And then certainly I didn't, I studied like Joe Johnson and, right. and I really loved the aesthetic. And it all, again, goes back to 2001 because the detail and the level of kind of greeble, microscopic detail, all that stuff I was really into. So we set up a meeting in a conference room and if memory serves me correctly, it was, it was Dennis, George, me, um, Jim Morris, who was running ILM at the time. Right. And then Ned Gorman, who had been the producer on the space race thing. And the main thing George had told Dennis was he doesn't want this to turn into a big deal. <laughs> he, did, he didn't want lots of people involved. He wanted to do a small crew and he wanted to see how inexpensive and how below the radar they could do everything because he was sort of looking at it more from a, like how much w could we do given the tools and then how much would it cost? And he was sort of running it as a, as a, as a test, but also without this, you know, bump, 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 it's the next big giant star Wars thing. And, and so he was really cautious about that. Right. So that's the one thing I would say. In that first meeting, he gave us a list of shots that he was interested in uh, uh, going back to. Um, and he gave uh, us a list of um, ideas of things he might want to add uh, in Mos Eisley. And then we, he talked about the job of the hut scene. Now, because it's historical and hopefully this podcast will last. And I, right. I think I may have said this in an interview or two, but it, I don't know that it's gotten ever really in print is in that meeting, everything he asked, everything he talked about 
as a as a guy who studies and loves cinema, it made total sense to me. It was all things that I thought were embellishments to the pre-existing skeleton that was so perfect about the original Star Wars. So I remember specifically, he was disappointed that every time you see the Jawas crawling, uh, I'm sure there's a name for it, but the crawling Jawa vehicle, right. um, you always saw it basically cut off at the exact same spot because that was the extent of the set. Right. So one of the things he talked about was, I'd like to be wider, I'd like to see more of the vehicle so it doesn't feel like a set, because he wanted to transition, um, and he felt that that would do something to do it. He also wanted to do, like clean up things, make things a little bit like Mos Eisley, a little right. more visible, like what am I looking at? It's just a white pancake out there. And of course in the Mos Eisley, he wanted to add scale. Right. He wanted it to seem like a much bigger place, when in fact in the original Star Wars, it's just like, you know, it's one building, basically. Right. Um, and in that meeting, he never mentioned anything about Greedo uh -huh. shooting first. Right. He never mentioned anything about, uh, you know, adding Jawas on top of the creatures in the right. downtown. So it was much more reserved. And so the first thing I did after that was I had to go get a print of Star Wars right. and put it on the movieola and find where he was talking about and then trace the actual footage like I did on all the movies I worked on. And then from there, I drew in the what he'd asked for in storyboard form. And then in a, like a maybe a week later, we met again. And then we went through those storyboards and then we talked about what was there and how we could make some things start to you know happen and then from there it was that was when he started talking about the new stuff which was you know the ronto and the little right. scurry creatures and then the low rider the yeah. the low rider swoop bike and um and it was at that point that the word started to kind of get out that it was happening right and a lot of my colleagues in the art department were really you know, they were very interested in having some <laughs> opportunity to participate right. in that process. But we ultimately really did keep it pretty small. Eric Tiemens, who went on to yep. work on the later trilogy, he was just out of art school. He'd just come out of Art Center. And um, I asked him to do some of the most Eisley um, concepts. And I know there were uh, a few other art directors that did a few pieces but by and large it was a pretty like gorilla low key operation and then i actually then it went slowly because it was being piecemealed in between other shows and i actually left industrial light and magic well in advance of it being completed and well in advance of it coming out in the theater. So Mark Moore, who I mentioned to you before we went on air, um, he took over the VFX art direction. It was actually him who had gone to the meeting then where George said, oh, I want to change it so Greedo shoots first. Right. And then he called me and told me this. And I swear to you, I thought he was joking. I thought it was just a joke. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? That's, that's the greatest scene. No, no, we're really going to do it. I was, <laughs> I was really glad that I have deniability. Right, yeah, you, you, you've wiped your hands clean. And now for the record, uh, we know it was not, not you in, in your department. So. Yeah, and then, and then, of course, the Jabba stuff, we, we, you know, we got our hands on that old footage, and, yeah. and then that brought into the whole picture, like a CGI character that had to perform, and, and that was pushing the envelope. You know, a lot of that stuff was really... Um, difficult also and repoing Harrison Ford into frame I mean we were doing like lots of new things I mean everything back then was new I mean it was all like nobody done it before so you try it you know and do it the best you could I mean literally the reason I am sitting here is because the beginning of the A New Hope VHS that documentary that five minute thing about the Dubax and about the Mos Eisley panning out and about Java is my first special feature and that was it like that was I was like oh this is <laughs> This is the best. Like, this is what I want to care about. And really looking back on it now, I know you've posted a picture of it, and I, I was blown away. The the Jabba on the floating dais, right? Which I think would have solved maybe the having to move Harrison yeah. Ford up and down if it had gone all the way to fruition. What was kind of the thought there? And was that like kind of the initial approach yeah. to Jabba? Well, you know, George, it's interesting because George is, he kind of goes back and forth from you know, I don't want to make this harder than it needs to be too. you know, it'd be great. <laughs> and, 
and so he's kind of both a realist and a dreamer at the same time. And in my first meetings, like I suggested, things were very dry. Like, I mean, for lack of a better word, everything was kind of like fix this, expand this frame, add this, add that. You know, it was it was really kind of like I had this this successful movie and I just would like to bring it up to another level. And then as we went along, then, of course, more stuff started to get added and it was like, Oh, okay. You know, this would be cool. But the question was, could you cover the actor or remove the actor? And again, back then, this stuff was super hard. Like we hadn't even really done, like we'd done some wire removals and things, but it was still super hard. And then the footage was old and it had film grain. And so it was like, well, what if it would be, you know, I think George right away wanted it to be a younger Jabba by a little ways. Mm -hmm. And you know, really wanted him to be in the frame and have eye line with Harrison Ford. Um, so I think that when we had our first meeting about it, no one knew. They they were saying like, well, it depends on how far he can stand up on his, you know, gut, how, how much of a cobra shape he can make compared to what he is in the movie. You know, he's just right. a big slug laying on the ground. Um, and then the it was like, well, maybe he could float. Like maybe we could put him on a, a floating thing. And I think actually in my memory is kind of, I mean, some of it I remember very cleanly, keenly, but some of it not so much as it may be in that first meeting where we talked about it is he said, no, I don't really think that flying, I don't like the idea of flying. He may have said that right away. Yeah. But I was like, I like the idea of flying. (laughs) (laughs) So I know that I did the, I know there's a sketch that I've posted that's like a thumbnail. I think I did that in the actual meeting. And then I did a version of it as a proof of concept. And I think it was actually shot down like the next meeting. I think I probably showed it to George and said, hey, remember we talked about floating? And he went, nah, (laughs) you know, that was not going to happen. I love it. And then I think pretty quickly, Dennis probably in another meeting, because he would also be meeting with technical people on the QT, probably was looking into how much they could manipulate the footage to to reload, you know, repo Harrison Ford, and right. and then of course um, there was the animation issue, you know, the blocking. And at one point we cut out a big um, cardboard Jabba, and then kind of. Uh, me and uh, Steve Williams, who went on to be the director of animation on that, we like blocked the scene with a big cutout, you know, to try to see if how much you would need to move Harrison Ford and stuff like that. But but it was but it was all like I said on the on the very much like low key, like we were doing stuff in in like a empty storage room with a cutout cardboard j- Jabba, like right. it wasn't. We weren't doing like sophisticated tests. Right, right, right. And that's what I love about special editions is because even then, the, it was supposed to be A New Hope. And then eventually, Empire and Jedi kind of were also brought into the picture. And I've talked to I've talked to Howie Weed and I talked to Mark Austin, who both were just kind of thrown into just doing it. You know, like, here, we're going to film this today. We're going to film all the new Cantina creatures. Or we're going to film whatever, right? It was it was almost for, for what the groundwork that it laid, both for the prequels and beyond right to show that star wars was still successful george knew that it was a a real thing but didn't want to like commit any actual real uh time to it which is very very interesting well you know the guy was very busy and i think he was in a gestation phase right like he was you know everybody forgets you know like he re-released american graffiti yeah i mean american graffiti was a huge box office success and so much so that when he was recognized for the accomplishment, it was made so much bank and he got control. He went back and put back footage that had been edited out by the studios that they didn't like before it was released. And then he re-released American Graffiti again right. as a special edition of American Graffiti. So he was already had done that. Right. So I don't think the idea that he would revisit, you know, Star Wars was a particularly you know, surprising. It certainly wasn't to me, right. um, except for the fact that I was working on it, which, which <laughs> was really surprise. weird. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then what's funny is then, then I got a credit on it and then they, they went back and added the art to the art of book, right. all of which were my big icons as you, a youth, you know, yeah. like I worshiped that book and it, it was, it's, it really was it, it, to this day. It's, it's, I kind of almost had a time machine Yeah. and I almost, I almost really did go back in time and work on the movie that made me go, work at the place you know a big circle um 
but I, I, I don't know. Like after I left and the movie was finished and then it hit the theaters or I think it was, really, I don't even, and it seemed like the more they went on to the other movies, the more substantial it got. Like, right. you know, it started to be like, oh, we can do that pretty easy. And, right. and time passed and the technology advanced. And I think that, you know, it became more and more seductive to go in there and, and right. you know, do things. Whereas I think in the beginning of the New Hope process it was with a light touch yeah. and he was really with a light touch it's just gonna you know fix the things that bugged him from the first day and then maybe uh, Im, you know embellish it here or there yeah. i don't think it was really like you know like suddenly getting a new box of crayons right. as it were yeah i mean really empire besides the addition of the wampa and some extended cloud city things remains relatively un- intact but then when you get to jedi and you start adding the the different band members and stuff is when it really I love it because that's what I first saw, but <laughs> but it's more of a, a nostalgic thing now. Enough Star Wars, because then that's your that's just the very very beginning of your filmography, and the rest of your filmography is crazy. <laughs> it is it is crazy, and the direction you've been able to work with, uh, not only Lucas, but you've worked with Guillermo del Toro five times now. Um, you've worked with James Cameron, like you mentioned. You've worked with Neil Blomkamp. These these really just are tours of the science fiction and and movie making in general. Um, I'd love to start with Del Toro because he's such an inspiration for me. Your first mm-hmm. credit with him is Mimic, which um, you designed the creature. <laughs> what was it like connecting with him and kind of starting on that path with him? My love and admiration for Del Toro is kind of beyond words. I mean, yeah. he he's brought me into projects and worked with me in a, the most c- kind of collaborative way one could imagine. But he's assisted me in evolving my um, aesthetics and he's assisted me in um, uh, introducing me to a larger universe of people and, and always being a big promoter of me. So um, he has a very special you know, place in my life story that, that I'm super appreciative of. The strange thing about Del Toro and I is that um, I had gotten to work um, with Matthew Robbins. Uh, Matthew Robbins, of course, was the director of Dragon Slayer and had actually done ghost writing on Close Encounters and um, had worked on a number of pictures uh, um, you know, batteries not included, and um, you know, it had been part of that posse of people that that orbited Francis Coppola at the same time when George had gotten started with Walter Merch and right. um, all these people. Uh, so I had done some work for Matthew, and Matthew and I, in a, in a kind of unexpected way, really hit it off. Um, we we enjoyed the process of working together. We um, I think we found each other, um, our, their, our demeanors were really well suited. And so what ended up happening is that he would often ask for me when he was working in, um, uh, at the Lucasfilm or an industrial light and magic, some, um, television commercial division, because mm-hmm. he did a lot of television ads in the beginning. It was easy because I wasn't working as much on the feature films, but as time went on, I, I, I was always busy when he would ask for me and I would try to still make time to, um, you know, go see him and maybe do some storyboarding for him. But it, it, we always kept in contact. Right. And, and then um, I was sitting at my desk one day and around at around the 1995 when I was working on the special edition and the phone rang and it was Matthew. And he said, Ty, it's Matthew. He has this really awesome way of talking. I've met a young director in Mexico City, <laughs> and you will work with him. <laughs> and then I, and it was so like, like he didn't say, I'd like to introduce you. Right. It was just like, I've met him. He's very talented from Mexico, and you will work with him. And I said, Great. And he goes, I'm going to arrange for you to meet. Not, not you're going to get an introduction. Right. So then, like a month later, I get a call from Matthew and he says, I'm bringing Del Toro tomorrow to ILM for a meeting. I want you to sit down on the meeting. And I said, okay. So I had to ask, you know, like, like producer, I had to go there because it was probably I had some other show I was working on or, you know, or I had to find the producer that was going to be at the meeting or something. And so Del Toro comes strolling in the front with Matthew. I was up near the reception desk. And then it was like, strangely, like, like we'd always known each other. Wow. I mean, he, he has that kind of effect on people, but in that moment in time, he was much younger. Right. You know, he's, he's still in his 20s. 
and I was younger. And I just remember that he came over and he, you know, gave me this big hug and he said, you know, we're, you're gonna, we're going to make, make great movies together. And, I was like, <laughs> yeah. and so it was, he was actually there to talk about another project of his called Spanky. Okay. It's also called Mephisto's Bridge, but at that time it was only referred to as Spanky. It was based on a novel, I think, and um, he gave me a copy of the. I don't think I got the whole script, but I got. Nah, I might have got a whole. I might have got a script, but I might have got a, just a treatment. I can't remember which. And he had done. He draws very well. You know that from the sketchbooks, and so he had a bunch of sketches, and so I said, "Hey, you know, I could do some drawings of these weird creatures that are in the movie." The next time I saw him, he was back a month later, uh, and he had screened Kronos. He screened wow. Kronos, I think, after that first meeting um, in the in the ILM screening room. And of course, I was my favorite part about that movie. The thing that I, I liked the movie a great deal, but I remember that the idea that there was a real insect living inside the gold insect. Yeah. I hate it. I hope I didn't give that away no, for no. anybody. Hopefully, but uh, hopefully it, people it, listening to this have seen have seen it. That, but. <laughs> that, that freaked me out so much, and I just thought, "Wow, this is so genius." Um, and so I remember really thinking, like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah!" Like, I really want to get get work with this guy, you know. Right. And so then the next meeting we had was on um, Mimic, right? And it was a short. It was part of an anthology in the beginning. There was a project that the Weinstein's were developing at Dimension Films that was called Lightyear. And it was four shorts. It was Danny Boyle, Guillermo del Toro, Brian Singer, and one other director. I, the name escapes me. It was going to be one of those pictures where you you know, you know have one movie in the theater, but then it's uh, four shorts, like an anthology, right. like the Twilight Zone movie. Right. And so this movie that was, we were going to work on, that was based on a short story. And um, it involved this creature that could imitate a human being. And so at that meeting, we, we talked about costs. We talked about ways that it might be able to be done and so forth. And then on the way out, he, he pulled me aside and said, I w I'd really like you to design the movie, production design. And I was very interested. And he goes, and, and we could work on the creature. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do <laughs> yeah. So. So then I started talking to him on the telephone and we started to get more serious about like, what would the deal look like? Like, what would I need to do? And, and I was like, uh, at that point in my career, I'd, I'd really had a great ride at ILM and I was very interested in finding out what I could do on my own. Because one of the things about being in a facility like that is a lot of the lion's share of the design work is already done before it comes in. Right. And I really wanted to be in that front line of designers. And so he, he said, yeah, you know, you should, we'll make a deal. We'll, we'll, well, well, you should get a leave. So my originally went to, then it was Patty Blau, who was the, you know, running the day to day. And I explained that I wanted to take a leave of absence and could I do it? And they said, sure, you know, well, how long do you want to be gone? And I said, six months. And, um, so they, they agreed and I, made the deal and I left to go work on that and went down to Mexico City. We were going to shoot Mexico City wow. and we scouted locations and I really was, I, I listen to people talk about Del Toro and I know what he's, how he's become so successful but if there's one thing that I'm most like enamored with in my own life story is for that like first year that we worked together that was just he and I. Yeah. Like we he brought me to restaurants all the time, and we I went down to Mexico City. We stayed in the same hotel. We went yeah. location scouting together, and then he, I went down home and meet his, hang out with his. It was just really awesome, and it was like, it was like a golden era for me yeah. of just being so in the mix and having already accomplished a lot, but like having a new chapter open up, and it really felt like that. Yeah, and so. Um, it, we did the first few creature designs, and I had found somebody to do a maquette, a small maquette. I found him through ILM. And then when he did his presentation to the Weinsteins, I think Bob Weinstein, um, uh, they they thought that what he was up to was crazy cool. Like, they really liked it. And they said, you know, we should make this a feature. And I remember I was down there after the meeting, and he expressed to me that he would turned them down to do the feature and I was surprised and he said I don't want as a Mexican director I don't want my first major American film to be La Cucaracha right. the, the cockroach and he really struggled with the idea of um, trying to make that story make sense in a long format 
So I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm cool. I'll do the short. Like everything, nothing changed for me. But then the next day, I mean, we, asked, I think we were all in Los Angeles at that time. See, I never looked, I never lived in Los Angeles. I lived in Northern California by I am in San Rafael. So I was down there. I would have been staying in a hotel near him. And I remember he said, Ty, meet me at the curb. We're going to go <laughs> to have lunch, you know, or something. And so I remember I got in the car and he said, I know how to make it a feature. <laughs> and I'm like, what? what's that? And he goes, I know how to make mimic a feature. And I said, yeah. And he, and he explained to me a scene where some water treatment guys um, are out in a boat using rakes or, you know, things to like clear a pipe for the water treatment plant. And then they, they see a dead boy floating in the weeds and they go, oh, my God, look, it's a dead boy. And then they go over and they turn it over. And then you see it's this gigantic insect the size of a boy, yeah. like the size of a three-year-old. And then that image and I think that opening hook got him so enthusiastic that he started to like think about it. like, and then now we've got to find out where this thing came from. And now we can do the backstory. And now it can be about, you know, evolution and, yeah. and we this whole thing. And so – he must have, and then I, my memory is a little unclear, but I think he talked to Matthew Robbins, and then they, I think he pitched it um, to the to Bob and you know to right. the Weinstein's, and then they said, "Yeah, let's do it." And then Matthew Robbins, the guy who introduced us, and Guillermo wrote the first draft, and right. you can still find that draft on online. Uh, I, I thought that first draft was fantastic, yeah. um, and then I think after that, the once we were up and running. Um, I think the studio started to really weigh in on him and really, you know, started to micromanage him in a way that was creative, uh, creatively um, grounded for him. And I think that it was it turned into a really difficult situation. And it was very difficult for me in as much as that I had not a lot of experience in production at that level. Right. And um, I wasn't used to the kind of the, the grind of it, um, you know, being away, you know, being in different locations, having different responsibilities. So it, I remember I, I always tell people I got five years of professional film production experience in a little over a year. Wow. Because that's the so Then I never went back to ILM. Right. So I, I overshot my six months. <laughs> I had a phone there and a drawer full of artwork for about a year. And then at a year they were like, Ah, you know, you're not, are you coming back or not? And I was like, I've got to make, I'm, I'm making this movie. Cause by then we were in full production right. and I think they put all my stuff in a box and, um, and then I, I, I don't know the exact calendar, but it seemed like I was on the movie on and off for, you know, over a year. Wow. Um, and then, and then of course the, the studio, I don't ever feel like really embraced the project and really put, a lot of resources into promoting the film. Right. I think it's. I think Half of Mimic is a, a, a fantastic movie. But it, there was some committee decision making that was superimposed on Del Toro, and I was like, it was unfair to him. Yeah, and so then from there, that's the kind of the real relationship piece. And then I right. became one of the usual suspects. And the next picture was, uh, you know, Blade Two, and that's right. when I shared an office with Mike Mignola for the first time, Love and that's it. when yeah. I. I was going to ask. <laughs> um, and then we became the usual, uh, not so much Brad Street, but Mignola, Barlow and me, you know, we yeah. were, uh, we were on, you know, the Hellboy movies together right. and then later on Pacific Rim. And, um, and, and as time went on, you know, there just wasn't enough Guillermo to go around. Right. And I was always appreciative of getting his calls. Um, and I'm, I will always jump to work with him. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, though um, it's it, the complexities of getting older and, and the complexities of evolution and, and his rise in, um, you know, in his career is all complicates things. So right. it's not going to be, I don't expect to be, you know, hanging out in the, you know, in his hotel watching VHS copies of his favorite movies <laughs> anymore. <Right. laughs> I love it though. That's so great. And that run that you're describing, right? The Blade Two, Hellboy, Hellboy Two, Pacific Rim, right? Like some of the most iconic genre, big budget things have all been very intrinsically art designed and so specific and so unique. And I think that really stands 
this uh, think tank of, of very talented people. Working with them is at the later stages, like by the time we get to Pacific Rim, I mean, we've worked enough together that I kind of understand his, like, um, you know, his primary uh, aesthetic concerns, you know, his his um, interests, his visual interests. And I can show him the crappiest drawings, like the worst sketch. And he can assess it, kind of make decisions and say, yeah, you know, make it a little bigger because he can, he knows where I'll take it from there. Right. So it's really a great symbiotic relationship that we ended up, you know, I mean, he is the auteur. He's the one with the vision. But my role in his universe is one that I feel very proud of and that is very it's very productive. It's very like, we don't do a lot of takes. Like I, when I work with him, I don't do nine versions of something. I do three or two, you know, or one. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like that comfort that comes from having a deep knowledge of the other person. That's really uh, fantastic. Well, talking about these people that you met early on in your career that then kind of carried through, how did you initially get connected with James Cameron? And then how did you kind of approach that moving in, into Avatar especially? Well, believe it or not, after Terminator 2 came out, so Terminator 2 had a couple of pieces that I know that that it's still, I still think it's a fantastic movie to watch. I mean, if you turn on the TV and Terminator 2 is on, it doesn't matter where you come in, you have to watch the whole right. thing. But one of the things that was really shocking to the audiences at the time was what what we what what was largely referred to as morphing morphing right. one thing turns into another thing and you can kind of trace that back to willow um you know where they were taking and trying to do these kind of seamless transitions between three different kinds of creatures yeah and they had really dialed it in jim had really figured it out and the t1000 and that whole kind of approach to this uh villain was so original and so unique and so based upon the, like the cutting or bleeding edge of technology. But one of the things that was fascinating to people is how do you get a metal blob to go like look like mercury and then go and become a shoe? Right. You know, or, or how do you get a person to like suddenly become a metal man? I mean, that was fascinating. And so um, I'm not sure exactly how it started, but I think it happened by an ad agency uh, president um, a big player in the ad world contacting Industrial Light Magic and somehow Scott Ross, who was running ILM at the time, getting involved in, wouldn't it be great if we could do some kind of morphing television commercial? And it happened to be that the, the product that they were interested in selling was light beer from Miller. And so uh, Scott Ross pulled together a meeting with Jim Cameron, this um, ad agency president, the possible art director, because I, you know, was uh, because I knew the CGI universe a little bit, right. and I was available. I was available, you know, and I was kind of on the rise. You know, my stock was up. <laughs> so I remember we flew down to L.A., and I had met Jim already because I'd met him when he was on T2. I just introduced myself to him. Hi, I'm Ty Ellingson. So at least when I flew down to the meeting, I mean, he knew who I was, and then they ended up. He said, well, if we're going to do this, I have to start like today because I'm going to be gone in a, a week for four months or something. So I remember I had flown down with just, uh, you know, like a, a like a, a, a shoulder bag and all I had was art supplies because right. I thought I might have to draw. But then, you know, he said, I can start on this tomorrow. This is Jim. And then I said, well, I guess I could stay. Huh. And uh, Scott said, yeah, that's great. We'll arrange your flight back, you know, stay. And so they, then Jim had a... Uh, uh, first AD from that he had worked with, uh, Scotty was his name. I don't remember his last name. And I went on to work with him again on Battle of Los Angeles, but that's completely different. And he took me to a hotel, and uh, I stayed overnight. And the next morning, I met with Jim in a bungalow in one of the studios. And then we talked about what he wanted, and, and we did some storyboards, and he called some people. And then, you know, the next thing I knew, that the project was real, and I – uh, did some work for him. And then eventually the project got large enough and complex enough that my role really kind of, um, um, you know, my role didn't uh, really proceed beyond a certain point because it started to become such a large project that they needed to bring in like 
people from the community that that were going to help build sets and these kinds of things that I had no real experience with at that time. But the one thing nice that happened was it gave me time to engage with Jim, ask him questions about like, hey, is it true that you did this on the abyss? And yeah. and he 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 was very giving of his time. Yeah. And he's another person that I'll never be able to adequately repay because um, he really always remembered me as somebody that was capable. And and what's weird is that that means a lot. I mean, you, you can say, oh, that guy, he knows how to paint well or draw well. But if you say, you know, that guy's really capable, you're kind of betting there's more. Right. You know, you're kind of saying he's probably got more in the tank, you know. Right. Um, and I remember that he always would make time for me, even though he was really busy. And when that picture was done shooting, that commercial was done shooting, um, they came to pick him up. And I had taken all of my favorite pieces of artwork that I had done at, at, at for other shows at ILM. And I had Xeroxed them, color Xeroxed them. Color Xeroxing was brand new at that time. <laughs> and I'd handwritten him this note that said, I really appreciated working with you on this commercial for Miller Lite beer. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, I really admire your films. And, it, and what I was saying earlier about not wanting to be a fan, you know, right. like I, I really did say, I really, your films are among my very favorite. Right. And if there's ever an opportunity that I could work with you, I, I would jump at the chance. And I, and, and what's weird is I had it in a manila envelope and I went up to him as he was getting in his car because they sent a car, you know, a day right. car. And I said, Hey, Jim. And he said, and he reached out and shook my hand. And, and he said, uh, I said, thanks so much. And he said, no, thank you. And I said, I have this for you. And he saw the envelope and he just took it and stuck it under his arm and said, thanks. Like he just got right in the car and left. Like he knew exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> like he knew like, oh, here's the, here's the play, the, yeah. you know, the batch of work. So Love then it. nothing happened. Uh, I ran into him a couple of times on some airline flights of all things. Yeah. And he always remembered me. And, uh, and then around 1997, I had, I had heard that about Avatar. Yeah. I mean, I, I had heard from some other people about the project and I had a friend who had worked at Lightstorm and she mentioned it and said, you should be on that. And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I sure should. But I, I mean, that was really early. And then at some point, um, I think because of my relationship with Del Toro, uh, I stayed on everybody's radar. I stayed on Jim's radar. I stayed on John Lando's radar. And um, my credits continued to rack up. Right. And at some point around 2000, um, it was just before Hellboy started, actually. Uh, I got a call from uh, Brooke Breton, who was a producer at Lightstorm, for asking if I could come do some concept artwork for Battle Angel uh, uh, because Jim was going to do Battle Angel at that time. Right. And so I said, sure, you know, of course. And then I ended up doing about six weeks worth of work on Battle Angel right. um, and then went off to do Hellboy. And then <clears throat> that was that. And then, like, another three or four years later, uh, I get a call to come work on Avatar. And then, I, for, for whatever reason, I like to think it's cosmic, um, when, when the call came in to do vehicle design, it was like, um, I, I said yes. And the next thing you know, I'm, like, meeting with Jim, and he's treating me like, you know, like a long-lost brother, um, and then he just had the list wow. said, these are the vehicles. These are what I'm thinking. This is this. And, and then that, that just got going and, and that was like two and a half years. Wow. And I mean, really, I, I actually just rewatched Avatar for the first time in a little bit because of, uh, I was going to Disney world. I was like, let me revisit this mythology and this, and the, the technical parts of it, right? Like you think of the Avatar is a very natural movie, right? And the, biologies and the infrastructure and everything that was built for that but then the corporation and the villains and the the mechanical aspect of all of that is so believable right and i would love for you to just describe it a little bit because that was the brunt of what you were putting together the power lifters and the helicopters and, and creating that that world that is just immediately you're dropped into it and, and incredibly believable jim always believed that the the audience needed to be introduced to pandora like one bite at a time right. you know he he i think he knew instinctively 
uh, well, he, he knows instinctively. <laughs> He's a genius filmmaker, but dropping everybody into the Pandora that he envisioned, floating rocks, blue guys, big, tall, blue people. Like he, he knew that they would go, whoa, 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 you know, what, what is this? Yeah. So, so there's a cadence about how we're introduced. Uh, you know, um, it's uh, Rick Carter, the production designer, always referred to it as uh, having a, being an, an analogy to um, The Wizard of Oz, mm. that, that the, 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 the venture star, which is, the big spacecraft that delivers Jake to Pandora right. that we see in the beginning that was designed, actually, that vehicle was designed by Ben Proctor, who's the production designer of the new movies, and Jim together. Right. And Jim had figured out the fuel and all that stuff because he's a, you know, he's a complete gearhead. Right. He knows all that stuff. Um, that that was sort of the, 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 the tornado in The Wizard of Oz. And then your, the next vehicle you see is called the Valkyrie Shuttle. And that was designed by Jim Cameron and Ryan Church. And um, that is kind of like the house that falls, right? Um, and then what you, when you arrive at Hell's Gate, it's the human, you know, it's the human uh, village, as you were. Right. And from that point on, every vehicle the mining vehicle, the the big bulldozer, the ground vehicles, the flying vehicles, the dragon, the scorpion, the the uh, you know the the Samson. All I, I Jim and I worked on those. Wow. That, that those are all uh, a product of, of my engagement with Jim, and he definitely was trying to establish a very grounded reality for the audience. Not just much so much just to transition into Pandora, but if you take a look at the Dragon, which is the large four prop vehicle that that has Quaritch when he attacks Home Tree, that has right. the the twin canopy flight decks. Like if you just saw that right away, you probably wouldn't buy it. So I think he 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 was trying to move people slowly from the grounded world into this like world of no rules right. and well the rules are there but the rules are fantastic rules right. and um i just felt like uh it was the most inspiring now what's weird for me is i i, I felt that when we were doing jurassic that we were breaking into the newest turf available um i even remember in the one day after screening some of the uh, main road sequence where the, where we encounter the Tyrannosaurus Rex on the rainy uh, roadway, I remember going to the coffee room, uh, like a little kitchenette with Dennis Muren and a couple other people, and I said, "Oh man, do you know what we're doing here? Like this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna blow people's mind." And we all were kind of like standing around, like saucer eyed, like, "Oh man, like how did this happen?" Yeah. Um, and I felt the same thing on Avatar. I felt, and, and there were five of us actually that had worked on Jurassic Park that were on Avatar, wow. which is kind of interesting if you think about it. Um, but at any rate, I think that he was moving through um, the idea that, that we bring people along and we give them things to hold on to and then we slowly take those away. Yeah. Um, the vehicles in the beginning when we first discussed them, I think he saw them as maybe slightly more futuristic, not in the rotaries or not in the the general principles or size or anything but like we had talked about maybe some more like kind of a uh 3d printed kind of like a carbon fiber exterior or some kind of you know maybe more sleek kind of look like it was manufactured in a whole new way but over time it, it seemed to me that 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 he became more and more uh interested in them as being just an echo of uh like the military, you know, yeah. like a very practical, you know, aesthetic that, that didn't need a lot of explaining yeah. that really you could understand it. And it visually, um, you know, uh, had a certain kind of presence. I can't tell you how many times on Avatar we had this giant chart, a big, you know, chart that had every animal and every creature and every vehicle to scale wow. in silhouette, in just black silhouette. And every time you modified something, if Jim said, oh, make the dragon a little bigger, I want to get two more amp suits in there, you'd have to like re, you know, size the, the yeah. silhouette. And what I found out over time is that he was making sure that every single element had its own recognizable um, presence. Yeah. So even the scorpion, which is the little attack 
uh, you know, twin rotor flight vehicle. And then the Samson, which is the bigger one that carries Jake on the first time into the jungle, they're very similar in the sense that they have rotors and tails and cockpits, but they, they are not confusable with one another. Like there's, right. they're different enough in scale. One's very short and, and, and stubby and has all these bristles with all these weapons. And the other one's kind of elongated and kind, kind of heavy. And then of course you'd never confuse those for the big dragon ship. And then you wouldn't really confuse the, the, the creatures at all either right. um so so there was a lot of really sophisticated visual storytelling going on and i guess if you just watched it recently i'm always surprised i've only gone i just watched it recently over the holidays for the first time in probably nine years yeah and i was actually pretty surprised at really how just how well um structured it is as a narrative just yeah. not only the narrative as a story but just the the filmmaking the sequencing yeah. the you know the way that things are staged the set pieces yeah. i always tell people when they you know there's always people that don't like avatar and that's right. fine and i you know say okay whatever um <laughs> but there's one thing about avatar that people overlook there's the scene where jake is in his avatar body for the first time and he he stays overnight in this shed with yeah. other avatars and Sigourney Weaver comes up and Jake is holding on to this appendage that comes out of the back of his head that connects to other animals so that he can basically control them and steer them with his mind. Right. That concept alone is incredibly bizarre and total sci-fi. Right. And, and Jake's looking at it and it's doing this kind of weird undulating kind of you know organic unfolding and Sigourney Weaver says, don't play with that. You're, uh, you know, you'll go blind or you're, <laughs> you're, yeah. Well, you know, whatever she says. And then he just kind of goes, oh, yeah, and then puts it away. Uh, another filmmaker would have spent 10 minutes trying to describe what that thing was, right. why out of the appendage of the Burks, you know, creature. But Cameron did it all visually. Right. And people forget, oh, yeah, I tell that story and people go, oh, yeah, I forgot that he hooks onto the animals with that thing. Right. And you go, yeah, because that's how good a movie he is. Really, you just can't bet against everything that he does is so calculated his worst movie is every other director's best movie and not only that but he knows the stakes he likes those high stake moves he likes yeah. the fact when we started on avatar it couldn't be made yeah. the first tests were you know they weren't there yeah and he wouldn't be making these sequels or prequels or whatever they end up being. He wouldn't be doing them if he didn't know he could succeed. Because who is the king of sequels? <laughs> it's, it's James Cameron. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it really Aliens? is. I mean, really after is. Alien, I didn't think anybody could touch it. Right. And then Aliens was, you know, it's a different kind of movie, but yeah. it's fantastic. And Terminator 2, I mean, come Yeah, on. oh my gosh. So, I mean, he's not going to... It's not going to miss one, this one. I mean, yeah. I think it's. I think everyone will remember very quickly why it was the biggest box office right. success in history. No, I'm very, I'm very excited to see what he, he has up his sleeve. Speaking of sequels, and, and we've been talking a while, I don't want to take too much of your time, but two of the interesting things on your whole resume are mm -hmm. two projects that have not seen the light of day. I don't know how much you can talk about them, but one involves Neil Blomkamp, who we've discussed a little bit, but again, a in my opinion, a huge sci-fi tour, but his Alien, again, we we're talking sequels, his Alien uh, 5, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. imagining, uh, you had something to do with, and then uh, Tron 3, you also uh, worked on a little bit. What was it like working on those two projects? Um, anything you can talk about? I'm sure a lot of it's under NDA. Um, yeah. But uh, um, both very but interesting to me, at least. Yeah, I mean, I was very, I mean, in my career, I've been really fortunate because I've worked primarily directly for directors. I've never had to be part of the, um, you know, I, I, I've never, like, been part of the art department that's insulated from the director's vision. In the case of um, um, of Tron, the I was actually one of several people that were kind of tasked to throw some concepts together to just kind of do some pre proof of concept stuff and um uh it 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 was it wasn't it there were some prompts given out like these are the basic things we're looking for but it was pretty much like let's get some work created and and like maybe it'll help us you know, uh, pitch the ideas to the studio right. or whatever. It was very, sh yeah, it was short 
And I brought up the whole story about working with the director because I actually um, was working for the production designer. And so I was even more removed from, you know, what what the director's vision right. was, kind of that stuff. And it was great. I lo- I've done other things for Disney. I love working for them. And uh, and then it was a pretty short-lived investigation. Right. I don't know what the status of the project is. I think that kind of project, you know, that was a very strong uh, sequel to the original. Yeah. And it I very, think it really was really really visually exciting so you know that could come back at any time um neil's project uh, like if there was one more thing i could add to my life that i really really wanted to have happen (laughs) um it was really to be connected to the alien franchise in a big way i actually was involved with alien 3 and was all set to go to england to work with david fincher on that and then at the last minute uh um, there was a, an issue that arose out of um, uh, with the studio and and and, and industrial light magic doing the effects, um, which had to do with Fincher uh, being from Marin County. That was in his home turf, and I think the studio didn't want him up there uh-huh. on, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> on his own. Yeah. But that was the closest I'd come. Right. And then, uh, of course, you know, when Neil was developing his project, I was super enthusiastic about it yeah. and i actually feel like we worked over a, the course of a summer maybe three months um uh which was a pretty long haul doing like done pictures a lot longer but those are actually ones that are going to get you know they're going into production right. but this was all part of a pre-production phase and um i was extremely disappointed because uh, not only did I love what Neil was trying to do, but I thought that our collaboration, because we don't collaborated before, was just it was like we hit the perfect pitch. Uh, like I, I was so proud of the work, and yeah. and I, I actually was doing the same thing. There's I was actually going like I can't believe this is going to happen. Yeah, I mean I I was just so excited by it, and and then unfortunately it really had everything to do with. Um, Ridley Scott's return to right. the franchise, and I think that that was that would have that had that would have that would have done the same thing to any director. Right. It had nothing to do with Neil. Right. And also, you got to remember that that um, uh, the what's the Mars movie he did with Matt, the with Martian, Matt Yeah, Martian. It was so successful. Yeah, and it seemed like now he's all teeing up science fiction again. Right. And, you know, and I think that that. But I know it was. I think Neil was very heartbroken about oh, it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I honestly, uh, and you know, I, I'm not talking about any of its content, but right. the likelihood of that coming back now seems very, um, unlikely. Yeah. Which is a bummer. Cause even the things that he has teased, right. He dropped a few things, I think on social media and the return of Michael B. Everything was just so as an alien fan, I was like, Oh, that is such an interesting way to do it. And as much, there are parts of the new movies that I really do enjoy. I think Fastbender is very, very good in them. But there is a part of me that kind of wishes that there was kind of the next next phase yeah. of everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, these things happen. It's funny that both of those happened to me. And like, I, I, and because my whole time in Hollywood, I'd only been on like one show that ever went into what they call turnaround. You know, yeah. where they basically say, well, we're not really going to finance this. So I wasn't really prepared for it because yeah. I'd never encountered it. And then to have it happen twice in a year, it was like, what's happened? I should never have moved to Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> you know, because they were both of those happened while I was here yeah, and working remotely. So, yeah. Well, Go. speaking of that, and to, I guess to end, end all of this yeah. is, is you're in Virginia now you, you are a professor at VCU and you're kind of training this next generation of artists. And I guess my question to kind of end all of this is like, what do you tell them? What's kind of the inspiration behind now this next generation? What would you tell someone trying to go into what you were doing and, and building a new skill set um, in this kind of new world of, of visual effects? Well, what I, what I tell students all the time is there's never been a better time to be a creative. Mm-hmm. When I went to California and started at Industrial Light and Magic in 1990, I either knew personally or had shaken hands with every um, name recognized concept artist working. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't very many. Ron Cobb and right. you know Nilo and um, Sid Mead and, and I. I mean, there there wasn't that many people. And so it was a small world and, and a small community, and those movies weren't made a lot. I mean, there wasn't the same output. 
um, there wasn't as many opportunities and movies were farther and further between, you know, like it was, it was a different time. When I was at ILM, they only did like four features a year. Yeah. Um, now, between uh, feature films, uh, episodic television, and video games, there's so many opportunities. There's so much opportunity to have a voice and right. be part of a really amazing project. Um, and the quality and caliber of the work is just continues to rise. It's just an extraordinary time. All that said, most of the time students say, but yeah, but it, the bar is so high and I'm so, you know, afraid I'm not good enough. And then what you, what you need to see is that as much as everything has changed, it's also remained the same in that you need to understand the principles of design. Yeah. You need to have a good grasp of art history, of cinematic history. You have to have a process, a methodology for for creating high caliber, impactful work on demand, and that comes through a development of a of a self strategy, a self understanding, and then you need to learn learn to draw and understand perspective in the figure, and if you do those things, you've got the foundational tools required to do all the the the, the work that that you'll need to develop that will come out of your imagination. And by solving problems, you start to learn more about yourself and you learn more about what's unique about you. And then you bring that, um, you bring those realizations into the next round of work. And then you learn from that round and you become better. It's a never ending cycle of improvement. Um, so it's more about, I'm a big, big believer in intention. Uh, you have to believe to your core that you're going to accomplish something. And if you're going to approach it in that manner, in a no, take no prisoners manner, um, that will make the difference. If you're waiting for the doors to open, you're not going to get there. You you see yourself as as engaged in this, the future you want, and you just don't stop going for it. I always tell my students, no one can give you permission to succeed except yourself. If you don't believe in your own destiny, then no one can ever provide you any validation, any affirmation that will get you there. It has to come from self. Well, I mean, that's a hell of a way to end this episode. Mr. Ellingson, thank you so much for taking the time and telling these stories. And honestly, I'm just so so inspired right now. I really, I really, really appreciate it. Your time. Excellent. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again to Mr. Ellingson for coming on the show and telling such inspiring stories about his career and his journey. His website, with more of his designs and projects, can be found in the show notes. Also in our show notes is the link to our Talking Bay 94 store that has a very limited restock of all of our credits line of shirts. Next week is my conversation with someone talked about quite a few times in this episode and a bunch of times in previous episodes, nine-time Academy Award winner, Dennis Murin. But until next week, stay tuned, leave a five-star review, and may the force be with you.